Side San Antonio 2019. Before we start with our next presentation, we'd like to thank our gold level sponsors, St. Mary's University, USAA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, and SANS. And for our next presentation, we've got Gan and Gone, Manipulation of the Masses for Political and Social Gains with Logan Hicks. Yeah! That's right, man. Texas. Man, it's good. To, man, I don't need that. Can they hear me? Can you guys hear me? No. There we go. You can't hear me? Don't lie to me. <laughs> All right, man. It feels good to be back in Texas. I was stationed down here for quite some time in Hood. They need that? Okay, fine, but only for them. Mm, whatever. But all right, man. Yeah, so you can hear me? Yeah, that's right. My mentor in the back, absolutely, Mr. Dodson, is awesome. Love that man. All right, so we're going to jump into this pretty quick. I like to hit the ground running. So my name's Logan Hicks. I'm ex-military, as you can tell. Army, I loved it. It was amazing. Oh, that's right, baby. That's right. I'd do it again if I could. Um, so I did, uh, after I got out, went into the DOD. I loved it. DOD was awesome. It was insane. They waste a lot of money. But you pay me very well to do that. Um, I've worked at obviously a lot of really cool places, Pentagon, DISA, Duum. Uh, I helped build the Mark Center. I helped tear down Sky 7. I helped build up DISA and move it for Fort Meade. That was super cool. I've worked for the U.S. Military Cyber School, training the, the nation's operators, uh, particularly working and building on their environments uh, that they train with. Um, I've supported Air Force One, NORAD, and Missile Command for that. Um, I've just worked at a lot of really cool places. Uh, one of my favorites was U.S. Courts, uh, which we're going to get into a little bit later here. Um, I run a lot of projects. The Panda Platform, which is uh, Platform Accessibility and Development Acceleration. It's a project I built expressly for the open source community to provide you unlimited data center and enterprise-grade services to support your projects. It's completely free. I have four petabytes of storage, an unlimited number of security devices, and it's free for you. So, work me as hard as you think you can. <laughs> um, I run other projects, Magi, which is a platform I use to monitor about 4 billion people. Any privacy advocates, you probably don't like me, it's okay. I only use it to, cut, to hunt down pedophiles, so you're not on my list. Um, Lucius, which is a malware development uh, and testing platform designed specifically for testing security solutions. That is being brought back now that the Marcus case is finally done. I don't like the ending verdict, but it is what it is. And I run other uh, projects. They're smaller in nature. They're on the GitLab. It's dead right now. My son's in Niku, I swear. This is a real Niku badge. Uh, so my platforms died while I was taking care of my son. Um, he's coming home today. That's fucking outstanding. Sorry about that. But like... We've been really worried about him. Um, he's coming home today. I got that text message like five minutes ago, so I'm like super jacked right now. Sorry. Uh, I haven't had any beer, and I just got that news. So that's really hard, and I missed the craft beer. I'm super sad. And this man's just like, I got beer. You didn't. <laughs> and Yeah, right? And uh, I run the Dream of Dreams Foundation. It's a platform that I created to solve several problems, including jobless and homeless veterans, which I will be bringing to Texas. And so we're going to solve that problem. I've still got to get a response back from the governor's office. I'm still waiting for that call or for me to call them. I mean, I don't want to, hey, I've got your phone number and where you live and your social security number. But uh, yeah, by the way, here's my thing. Yeah, that's going to freak him out. Um, so I'm waiting for him to contact me. Um, hopefully soon. My number's out there. You can Google it. Uh, that's my actual number, by the way. Do not SMS bomb me. I do not find it funny. I find it hilarious, especially when I route it back. <laughs> but uh, that's a PBX for you, baby. All right. But yeah, I support several projects in that. Um, this is a breakdown about how I spend my time. For some reason, people want to know that. Uh, I have incredibly good time management skills. I work about 110 hours a week between projects, full-time job, my own company, my family, and everything else because contrary to popular belief, building a home is actually that, building a home. So if you know me on Twitter, raise your hand. Thank God. <laughs> so over the past two years, I've been working very hard to build a bot that I call the uh, Angry Orange Trash Panda. 
Its icon will be a red panda, and it's designed to fight arguments for you on social media platforms. It is cross-platform capable, and someone brought up a brilliant idea I never thought about. It can also now text. So I'm working on that. It'll fight your text arguments for you, your email arguments for you once I get that integrated uh, with Python uh, through a Django platform. And it will fight people for you using ANN networks. Um, and I've been training that uh, by gathering the data sets. And then it's using my arguments and other people's arguments against other people. So it will actually fight your battles. But but because it's awesome, like you can summon. I'm gonna be like hashtag summon angry orange trash panda, and he'll come fight for you. Like it's like a Pokemon on the internet. <laughs> you can't beat me. I win. Like he will fight you indefinitely. He's rabid. He's like got rab. He's rabid rabies. It's like amazing. It's a crazy idea. I have plenty of internet bandwidth, and as you can tell, nothing to do in my life. <laughs> But uh, it's just a project, but I do, I sincerely apologize to a lot of people, like, I've pissed off a lot of people. But uh, it was, it, I think it's worth it. We'll see. Maybe they'll forgive me. Um, a lot of people think I'm a Markov bot. I'm really not. Kinda. I do take information from the Markov bots, though, and then add that as the arguments to see how they play out. And typically, they're really dumb. The last one, we were having an argument about how Central America isn't really real. It's just like a fabrication of, of something the United States cr created in regards to Panama, the Panama Canal. And it posted a map from the 1500s to support its argument. Not exactly logical, but I'll allow it. OK. <laughs> so it's pretty awesome. I'm obviously not the world's best developer. So it's something I'm learning as I go. So it's like a fly-by-night madness. Um, to break into the platform, it is an incredibly sophisticated environment. I have spent an astronomical amount of time and money to build it. Uh, right now, as of the last cost assessment, it's over $800,000. So that platform is not free. But uh, it's got blue coats, it's got steel heads, it's got, uh, like I said, four petabytes of storage, quarter of that solid state space. Uh, it's got over four and a half terabytes of RAM. Like, I think like over a thousand cores, it's just stupid. I mean, it's like a mid-grade company's hardware. It's out there and it's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It's built on OpenStack with Ceph clustered storage. Um, I've created a brand new storage type um, integration with that to natively integrate both um, LXD containers and Docker containers to be able to run natively with Ceph. Um, I don't know if that was overkill or not, but it works well for me. And I'm kind of lazy, so it's like anything I can do to cut corners, I will. Um, Apache and Postgres, I love Postgres. I swear by Postgres. It got bought by Microsoft, so I want a divorce. Um, but uh, it's not, it's, it's, it works, man. I'm not a database man. I'm not a database admin. I'm not a database engineer. But it runs really well. And replication did not take me six days to build, like with SQL. It took me like 60 seconds. And so that's why I use Postgres. Also because of the fact the only real language I know is Django. So <laughs> there's that. Um, my configuration management is actually a dual uh, macro micro uh, a sophistication that I've openly told people to try out. And they, they don't really listen to, but it works amazingly well for me. I use Juju for my macro controls and deployments and Salt for my micro configurations for security and compliance. And so that works incredibly well for me. I don't know why other people don't do it, but I mean, if you want to go drive yourself insane with an Ansible or something, that's, that's your Kool-Aid, man. But it's woe for me. All right, so before we get too deep into my talk, I will give you a word of warning. What I do is incredibly dangerous to me, mostly. Um, if any of you guys are familiar with what goes on with Facebook moderators, they have an incredibly high turn and burn rate. So does Twitter, so does Instagram. Um, and that's because the content that we're exposed to is pretty despicable, to be honest. There's some pretty shit people out there. Um, but um, so I would tell you don't do it, but then you're just going to go do it because I said not to. Like, I know my audience. Um, so I would say when you try this, do so with substantial amount of filters and do so at your own risk because it is, like I said, incredibly toxic. The people I'm exposed to are toxic. Some of them are dangerous. They're violent. And I have found notes on my car in the past. Now, whether that's from the Russians or someone I pissed off, that remains to be seen. 
Um, my source code, I'm going to make most of it available on my GitLab through the private repos, which will be an invite-only basis, and a lot of the project stuff will be openly available on the public GitHub basis that can be found there. Um, so the project started because I had a cool idea. By the way, if you ever have a cool idea, you should stop. Because it needs to have a budget, a plan, and, and, a, and an objective completion date. Like, because I started this thing in April of 2013. I am still building it. So that's six years later. Um, but yeah, I wanted to see how hard I could push myself and what kind of challenges I could drum up with. And um, when I started getting a little further in at about, I would say, 2016, 2017 range, I wanted to see... That was around the whole Trump fiasco. And I was like, I was like, I wonder if I could do that. Can I build something that can do that on an automated basis? Because that just sounds a lot harder. And uh, I had to start realizing I didn't know anything about people. Like, when it came to people, I was like, I people. And then I started looking into psychology, and I was like, I don't people at all. Uh, turns out they write entire books on this. And there's like a whole job on this, like a whole field. Yeah, and their job is very hard. Um, so I had to learn about a lot of things. So I started focusing on the people that I did know, which is tech people, which I know pretty well. And they typically break down, as it describes here, into an AB type personality. Um, they're either very, very passive or exceptionally aggressive. And um, as we like to call it in the Twitterverse, Either you are an echo chamber or an asshole. <laughs> um, but that is typically the way it breaks out. But there are some characteristics amongst every one of them that comes out in certain conditions. And that's that they're typically aggressive. Um, they're very territorial. There are certain things like this is my lab or this is my container or my project. And if you touch it, I will spit venom in your face like a dinosaur. Like, it's like straight up, like old school Jurassic Park, where they eat the guy in the rain, like hardcore. Um, a lot of people have a, have what I, what, I don't like the word lazy, but we're kind of lazy. I mean, like, I openly admit it. I'm, I'm kind of lazy. I like to recycle code. I like to recycle system architectures. I, hell, I'll even recycle old documentation if I can just type a few things and make it up to date. And that's just how we are. Um, we're very impatient, typically very, very impatient. Uh, like when it started getting down to the last 10 minutes, I was like, I want to talk. And I was just like, I don't want to talk, but I do want to talk. And so uh, we're, we're typically very impatient. Um, there's a lot of other things, but uh, we're very pattern-based. And so we'll do the same things typically every day. We'll watch the same shows, uh, maybe the next season. Uh, we'll watch the next animes. We'll hit Netflix up. But we're typically very scheduled. We'll work our period of time. And then that's our life every day, 9 to 5. And then 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7 type deals. And that's just what we do. And so we're very predictable. And that's where it gets fun, um, is because we're also very predictable. We also have to have some form of break point, which is typically our social engagements, which is where we become highly socially dependent on our circles. And uh, if you actually look into human psychology, and this is when I started learning about people to the hardcore degree, people will actually die as infants if they're removed from social circles. If you deprive a child of human contact, it will die. That's been proven and tested. So that's terrifying. Um, so what I started to realize, what I didn't know, was that people are very different. They are not the same. There's, there's, we, we say, oh, well, there's these types of personalities, like, oh, you're an Aries, I'm a Capricorn or whatever. Like, we're like, oh, yeah, we're all the same. No, not even close, man. Like, we don't even like the same shoe colors. Like, I don't even, I don't even know why I wear these shoes. I don't like them, but I wear them because I'm told to. Um, but uh, we're very culturally different. We're rationally different. We're very emotionally different and structured in, in very different ways. And uh, that can play to both a benefit or a downside. And that's when you start getting into big data. And that's where big data really starts to play a really big impact really, really quickly because you need to start analyzing people on an individual basis at incredible scale. And there's only a handful of solutions and sources that you can do, for, to, do to do that, which is social media sites, professional um, uh, grouping sites like LinkedIn, uh, places like that, uh, any place where you have like resume storage, like monster.com, 
Contrary to popular belief, I can actually search your name in those sites on a recruiter account and find you directly uh, on many of them. Not all of them, but many of them. Uh, other big things that you can do is you can look in for publicly facing databases like I did on my last campaign doing bug bounty hunting where I found like 70,000 exposed Elasticsearch databases. You might want to lock that down if you don't have a login. Um, and uh, a lot of cloud platforms, uh, surprisingly and terrifyingly enough, S3 buckets galore are just loaded chock full of your data. And if you start searching for those buckets and then you have subparameters for searching inside that uh, content if discovered for like certain things like names, pictures, etc., you'll find it. And you'll find it in a grand abundance and it's pretty awesome. Um, when it comes down to analysis, it really is a dealer's choice. You should go with what you're comfortable with, not with what you're told to. And that's because just because you're told to use it doesn't mean you're going to use it effectively. It's like if I walked over to somebody and said, here's an AT4. Go shoot that car with it. Just because I hand it to you and I say use this tool does not mean you're going to use it effectively. You'll most likely 50% of the time end up shooting me. So please don't. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really important. Me, I like Elasticsearch. I think it's an incredible tool. I do not work for Elasticsearch, and I was not paid to say that. Um, they're just an awesome group of people. The tools are amazing. The support for the platform is incredible. And the documentation on it is just insane. Um, on top of that, I like using Django with Postgres integrations because it's natively supported and it works incredibly well. It's a CRUD system and it's me friendly. Uh, and when I say that, I mean I'm not a very good developer, but it's easy to learn and easy to work with. Now, when it comes down to engaging these issues and you start looking at engaging mass populations, you have to start understanding there has to be a structured process and procedure for how you approach this. And that is because if you change your process, you skew your data, you skew your results, you make it very, very difficult to understand the campaigns that you've engaged in. And so I found the easiest way to do that is to liken it to the OSI model. And so you identify by region. What region physically are they in? Whatever region they're in is likely going to impact several characteristics about them. Their socioeconomic status, their cultural status, uh, their ethnic status, uh, things about their history, their past, disasters that have impacted them collectively, uh, major events in their lives. All these things are going to impact their social behaviors in one direction spectrum or another, but they're all going to share those same traits which makes it a general way to populate them into databases in different sections or different micro databases, especially if you start doing incredibly large campaigns in the hundreds of millions of people because you still need your data to be reasonably effective, which means performance needs to make sense. If I write a query and it takes it six years to finish, well, it's not really going to matter that I got the results back on who did or didn't like George Bush Sr. if we're in the 2026 elections. So it has to really make sense. And I found that, again, modeling against the OSI model, it very natively comes to us from the tech industry. So I found that that's what I use. And uh, like all things in the OSI model, it's almost always a layer 8 issue. So do keep that in mind. Um, so when you're going to engage in these individuals, because inevitably we know that's what you're going to do. You're going to build the system. You're going to play with it. You're going to start messing with people, just like I did. And I promise you, everything you think about how fun it would be, it's that and so much more. Uh, so much more. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it does have lashback from time to time. But uh, it's, it's worth it, man. It really is. Um, and you, get, you can do a lot of good with it, too. And I'll say that. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but uh, normally, almost every engagement, it has to start with a trigger. And that's what I like to call the ignition point or subject zero. Whether it's a person, a place, or a thing, it's something that's going to set something off. Whether it's me walking out and be like, abortion is evil! And like out of nowhere, all of these people are just like, kill the infidel. Like, it's amazing. You just piss so many people off with just one trigger, just boom. America is like a powder keg, man. Or at least Twitter is. Um, and it's just so easy to start a fight over nothing, which we'll cover in a minute. And then there's always the response. There's going to be the point, there's going to be the response, and there's going to be the reactive response to that response. This tactic is very heavily used by social media platforms as well as news media platforms to generate content and to generate content response, which generates engagement, which generates profit. They don't care. So if anyone thinks they're ever going to stop making like neo-Nazis go away, that's never going to happen. And that's because they make hundreds of millions of dollars a day 
on these people because they're driving more content. Oh, that neo-Nazi said what? I'm going to go click, 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 click. Five clicks later, you've looked at like $12 worth of ads. Like, that's what's up. It's never going to go away. Um, and understanding that is definitely going to change the system. You just have to understand that. Now, when you start looking at campaign design, campaign design is very, very important. If you don't understand your campaign design, you're going to run into issues. You have to draw a box. What am I going to put in this box? If it doesn't go in this box, it has to go in that box. Campaign A, campaign B. You might end up building 30 or 40 campaigns off of one idea. Do not mix them. The bigger the box, the bigger the data set. The bigger the data set, the harder it is to manage it, the harder it is to interlock things together, the harder it is to interconnect things together, the more difficult it is to execute the campaign successfully, the more likely you are to have to start over and do everything all over again because you did something that triggered a cascading failure that caused the ultimately the data to be useless. And that's very, very important. Now, when you're building your systems, it's like I said, do something with a system you know. If you don't know the system, don't use it. And that's because it'd be like me trying to walk over and, and use a Solaris box. It's just, it's going to end bad, man. <laughs> like, it's not that I don't know Unix. It's just, I don't know Solaris. It just seems like voodoo or something. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it is Unix that I don't know, but I've played with BSD, free BSD, and it's just, I think it's Unix, man. I think Unix is just like, it's too hard. <laughs> so pass. Um, but definitely know your tools. Uh, and test your tools internally. One of the first things I discovered when I was messing with Twitter, Twitter has a lot of security implementations in place to keep you from just screwing with people. Contrary to popular belief, there's a lot of things there protecting you as a user. I had to actually build a Twitter clone to figure out how to navigate the waters, so to speak. Not to bypass the security things, because that would be against the rules. But play within the sandbox to the maximum level possible. I had to build a Twitter clone to do that. And so it was very challenging, um, but there's tons and tons of clones out there on GitHub. You've got a clone for pretty much every major site that exists. That's why I like Django, because there's a Django clone for everything. And that's because everybody, for some reason, decided to use Bootstrap. And so it's Django, Bootstrap, insert some kind of JavaScript here, database, typically some kind of major database like Postgres. And that's your entire setup again and again and again and again and again, which we'll get to those systems. Now. Before you start your engagement, make sure your shit's working. I was like halfway through an engagement a couple of weeks ago, and then like I realized I wasn't getting any data. And then I checked, I had cut off all three of my Postgres database servers. They were just, just laying there, and I was just like, what happened? And I was like, oh, I was putting in more hard drives and didn't want to electrocute myself when I was swapping out the RAM. I killed my databases, and I just left them off. So definitely check your hardware. Um, when you start building baselines, um, like I said, one of the things you want to do with your baselines is, uh, well, it, it depends. If you're going to do like what I do, and you just, if you're just going to try it out, don't build a baseline, just build whatever you want. But if you know for a fact that you really enjoy what you're about to do, build several baselines because you're going to blow them away a lot. And that's why I use templating, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but the baselines are very, very important. And then when you start to accumulate your baselines, um, not just when you're doing engagements, but when you're doing with, well, sorry, not just the software, but when you're doing your engagements, you want multiple baselines for that as well. So when I start to engage people, for instance, on the, the interpersonal basis, I need to know where I start at. And typically for an account of my size, that engagement's around 100 to 700 impressions, which you need to keep that number in your mind as we get to the engagement. So this was a pre-base to a fourth stage campaign. So it's broken up into four series over a period of time for a cool off period. I've learned that if you make people angry and you give them just enough time to breathe, you can make them angrier. And then you let them breathe and they get angrier. So it's like an ex-wife. You're just building up to that explosion point and it's really awesome and you're gonna see. So this was about stage three, I would say. Um, so when I look at my campaigns, um, uh, for this campaign we're about to cover, uh, I did a lot of engagement stuff, so I was looking at things for people that I knew that I could get to. Um, and so I uh, started looking at the campaign from the perspective of, okay, I've got about 70 to 90 people that just actively harass this, 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 uh, this profile, so to speak, that I built. And they're just like, I really set them off, I think around campaign two. 
uh, phase two of this. Uh, uh, it's, it, yeah, it was campaign two, and it was the second phase of this campaign. And I really pissed some people off uh, with immigration. So that uh, that went really, really well. Um, and so I was uh, I was messing with that, and um, I started building profiles with some of them with Magi system. That worked out really well. Um, and I started looking at the other content from other sites that they were posting on, so I could see the reactions on other social media. Because typically, when someone rants about something that makes them mad enough, they don't just talk about it on that site. They'll go say it on something else like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram if they were on something like Reddit or something. So they're they're constantly talking about it multiple places, but they'll say something different. And you can tell where their emotional trail is going. And so if you know if it's like, if the, okay, they're getting angrier, perfect. If they're getting a little more calm, okay, I need to poke them a little harder. And so we'll get to that in a second. And so for me, everything that I do, I store. Like I said, I have four petabytes of storage. I can store everything pretty much for forever, at least in my life. Um, and so that brings me to the objectives in my campaign. So I said I wanted five objectives. I wanted to get someone to argue on the internet in the United States that you are not entitled to your constitutional rights and that they can be changed at any time. My second one is I wanted to be harassed, which is, that's an easy objective. I was like, I'll get a low hanging fruit in there. Then I said I wanted to be sexually harassed, so that's like a hard wall. Like most people won't cross that line. And so I wanted to see if I could push someone that far. And then I wanted someone to threaten me physically. I mean, that one's a, that one's, okay, that one's a low hanging fruit. Most people are tough guy syndrome. They'll threaten you. No big deal. And I wanted to be doxxed, which is actually harder to get done to you than you could, you would think. Like most people won't cross that line. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I started looking at the groupings for the metrics. So as you can tell, I have a substantial amount of data. Surprisingly, this is provided to you for free by Twitter. They will tell you everything about your entire grouping that you are engaging with. It's on everyone's account under profiles. You drop down on the list. It says analytics, and all that data is right there. It tells me everything about you that I need to know. Like 97% of the people I engage with like dogs. So, gee, I wonder how they'll react if I'm like, PETA kills all the dogs, and then show a dog getting eaten by a lawnmower or something. Like, I wonder how that will cause. What reaction could that possibly cause? Gee, I wonder. And then, as you can see here on this scale, the massive blimps, those actually represent hundreds of thousands of reactions. So the average small scale one here, if you zoom in, I don't know if it'll let me let me do that. Let me do that. Yeah, that's 1,500 on an account with 1,500 people. So I got a, one impression per person on the smallest low-hanging bar. Now, when you see the other ones that are astronomical in size, you can see a huge difference. Now, when you start to engage these people, they don't sleep, it seems. So I realized I will get tired. I'm on a different time schedule, and I work hard, and I have a baby. So I need to sleep. That does not mean my systems have to. So you can automate this entire process with Portainer, which will allow you to build incredibly sophisticated templates to include automatic message sending systems with a built-in browser through Selenium, which we will cover in a minute. And it will actively allow you to send communications and responses back with a pre-populated list of things to say, like with Angry Red Trash Panda, my little trash baby. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be totally amazing. And then you can automate all of this with Python scripts. It's very, very easy. I mean, if you just like PowerShell, I tried PowerShell. PowerShell will work. I don't know enough Bash to do it, but I know it can be done. Um, but typically, I would just use Bash to give me a, a Python shell, which then I'd drop into subsystems with, with PowerShell if I was going to do that. But it, it, it's, it's wonky. I've been playing around with the uh, developer shell and with PowerShell being migrated over to, to Linux. So we'll see how that plays out. And then you can automate a lot of things with Django, but we'll cover Celery in a bit. Now, when you're building a profile on people, you need to understand the individual. You need to understand them to an intimate degree. So. That looks about like, all right, from this guy in the Star Wars shirt over, because I'm a Trekkie, all the way over, statistically, I have your social security number and everything else about you. And it's pretty awesome how much information is out there on the internet in database dumps, database leaks, 
Uh, I've got about 2 billion email addresses. And like I said, I actively monitor about 4 billion people. And you can do this through social media systems. They give you access to this unlimited, unrestricted, well, if you spend money, it's unlimited. I mean, but you can, you can hit it for specific objects, specific persons, and specific time frames to the point to where pretty much it's unlimited if you just manage your resources properly. So yeah, we'll say unlimited with some quotes. Um, but uh, you want to build that profile, and it's very important why. Because this gentleman here does not react the same as this gentleman here to my jokes because he finds me funny and he doesn't. See, he's like, no, I don't find you funny, you suck. And it's like, okay, go watch Chris Rock. I'm not a comedian. <laughs> but yeah, and it's, uh, it's very important to understand your audience, and that's because as you engage your audience, you'll learn certain things from you. They'll tell you things without realizing they just pretty much handed a playbook on how to harass them. And that can get very dangerous for you as an individual very quickly, as you'll very soon see. Now, other things that you want to know is you want to know historical statements about them. So typically from Twitter, I can pull back easily 10 different years of things that you said online. Most social media platforms will support that request. So like for Trump, for instance, I pulled like all of it. Don't. <laughs> There's a lot. I thought I was going to break my internet connection for a minute um, and get like a phone call. Why did you break our internet? Um, I didn't do it, I swear. Um, but yeah, so there's a ton of information you can get. The more you catalog, like I said, the more you have. But it's the same issue the NSA ran into, which is they have too much data and they can't do anything with it because in order to process it, you have to process all of it. And the issue with processing all of it is as you process it, it takes time, it takes compute, it takes uh, resources, electricity, it generates heat. And if you push your systems too hard, like I found out, you will trip all of your breakers and all of your servers will turn themselves off. Um, yeah, yeah, that was not fun. Um, other things you want to know about is the connections, connections. You want to know how your network that you're targeting is interconnected. And so once you start learning how they're interconnected, you can start understanding how to trigger them. So you can learn how to, for instance, say something to you, which sets her off. And that's because you two are friends, but I know that. I also know that she likes cats and you like dogs, for instance. And that's just an example. She may not like cats. She looks like she doesn't like cats. She's not a cat lady. It's okay. You have two cats? Oh, <laughs> look at that. Statistically, there's always two. Um, yeah, so and that's how it plays out. And uh, it, it gets pretty good pretty quick. Um, because then you can be like, okay, well, I want to set this guy off, but in order to set him off, I have to reach her, but I know she needs to retweet it, so I'm going to have like a dude kicking a cat, and so she's going to retweet it because she's mad, and he's going to see it, and he's going to say something, and then I can engage him. Boom. He got dragged into the conversation. But that's how you do it. And then once you build that up, you need to understand a handful of very important things. You need the profile. You need to read the profiles. Then you need the emotional state of the individual. Are you calm? Are you anxious? Are you bored? And then from there, you can say, okay, well, this is where they're at. What are their areas of expertise? What do they know? Because if I say something stupid about something you know that's ignorant, by nature of being arrogant, you're going to say something. We know those people. Someone says something stupid on the Internet, you just have to say something back. No, that's not right. It's blah, blah, blah. That's not in the Declaration of Independence. That's in this. The Constitution doesn't say that. It says this, which is what I used to drag the guy in for the Constitution thing. And, um, and then these simulated events. Like I said, those are my uh, objectives here. This is the analysis. This is how the initial reaction started. As you can see, at 190,000 impressions from about 200 from normal, I got a slight response. Well, it was a thousand times, but yeah, so it was, it was pretty awesome. As you can tell, I could say hashtag triggered would be a very good description. Um, very, very good information. And I captured all five flags. So if this was a capture the flag event for DEF CON or something, I definitely would have won. I got someone to threaten me. I got someone from Mozilla to build a harassment campaign against me. I successfully raised through her $15,000 for women's reproductive rights. 
So I find that to be an exceptionally successful campaign through two different organizations. So it did very, very well. So it was abortion and Planned Parenthood. But I feel like that came out very well. Um, I got the guy to argue against me for the Constitution. He argued that it wasn't something that was set in, in, in motion that, that, that could absolutely be changed. They're not completely Im immutable. And we'll leave that there. And I got someone from Google to sexually harass me, which was just beyond phenomenal. Now, please don't blame these people. I'm very good at what I do. And as we continue to dig through this, you'll see I really enjoy what I do. I don't like tormenting people, and they don't deserve to be punished for something that was honestly incredibly manipulative with, with two of them with like six months plus of research into everything historically that they've ever done ever. So that was like a social engineering campaign that just, it was designed to crush and destroy like six people. So it, it's just not fair. Um, but now we're going to get into a live campaign. Does anybody know who Jason Lee Van Dyke is? Nobody? Wow, this is Texas. He's in your area. Oh, man. Okay, so what happened, see what happened was, is I was driving back up, got into a little bit of a, a scuff with Popat. And uh, Popat's cool guy, uh, ex-federal prosecutor, maybe potentially still federal prosecutor, and Popat brought to my attention through another guy, Arden something, honestly, I forgot him. He wasn't even on the list. Um, but he brought up a case that I thought was interesting sounding from an attorney who just lost his shit. And I was like, attorneys don't just lose their shit. Having worked from U.S. courts, they are very calm and structured people. It takes a lot to push an attorney to do something crazy like the affidavit that I read that he actually served to a court. It was insane. And I was just, he was like, I refuse to be in the same courtroom as them. I'm not coming back until this guy is dealt with. And I'm just like, that is incredibly extreme. And no one just quits their own court case against a lawsuit they filed against someone unless there's an extreme circumstance. So I was curious, right? And me being me and having the resources I do, I was like, you know what? I've got 16 hours since I drove here from Georgia. I'll call him. Let's see what happens. So I called him. And he answered. <laughs> Oh, and it was lovely. So I got to dig into this issue because I'm curious. I'm open-minded. He was He's part of this group called Proud Boys. Does anybody know what that is? So Proud Boys is actually a, a group that I look... No, don't. No. Down. Down. You don't like it? Yeah. It's okay. I looked really heavily into that. Um, turns out they're actually not nearly as bad as you think they are. Uh, one of the actions that they took recently was they reacted to Hurricane Harvey by, for four days, they provided disaster relief, uh, medical treatment and assistance and supplies to organizations and individuals out there. That's been confirmed by the National Guard, the constable, and the mayor. Uh, so it's highly unlikely that an individual classified as a hate group would provide aid and assistance to a groups, groups that are primarily African American and Hispanic and population. And that again comes down to profiling the area and understanding the geographic circumstances. Now, there are other actions that I found behind that that I don't agree with. There have been things that have been said that are absolutely unacceptable. But a group collectively is not compromised of one individual. It's collectively the entire room. It's like saying all hackers are criminals because one person broke into a bank and stole like a hundred million dollars. We're not all criminals. That person, definitely. Us, not so much. Um, but I started looking at this issue. It got really fascinating really quickly. Um, this is a breakdown of the campaign for the subjects. Started analyzing the subjects, understanding where they come from, who they are, what they do. So subject A is Jason Lee Van Dyke, the individual, the attorney. He does have pending charges against him, uh, pending suspensions, ongoing suspensions, and potential disbarment. Uh, he's a state bar individual for affiliation, and he's also a proud boy. That's confirmed. Then the opposing party is uh, subject B, which is Thomas uh, Retzlaff, which is uh, his profession is supposed to be a systems administrator for websites. Uh, he is a convicted felon. with vex He's also been uh, court-ordered as a vexatious litigator, which means he actively tries to sue people into oblivion with frivolous cases to the point to where the court said, you're just here to harass people. Um, and he's got a substantial number of affiliations, uh, allegedly, uh, one is a hacker on hacked forums, which I've tracked down to about six different monikers. Uh, pinkmeth.com, a revenge porn site. Tex, uh, T E X X X A N.com, which is a revenge porn site. Is anyone up.com, which is a revenge porn site. And several others. Now, this is where the things really start to get interesting. 
is when we started analyzing the group. Because like I said, when you look at an individual, the profile needs to expand. So when I started looking at the profiles, I started to notice a repeating pattern. Mr. Retzlaff has collectively engaged every attorney, individual, uh, Marines, um, private investigators, and other collective individuals who have gone after revenge porn sites. And he's tried to sue them on multiple occasions to include filing multiple grievances in multiple jurisdictions against every attorney that's actually successfully shut down or attempted to shut down the revenge porn sites and any attorney that's attempted to defend the individuals from the litigations that he has filed against said attorneys. So it's been um, quite the fiasco. It's Like I said, I learned about this. What's today? Sorry, I've lost time. Um, today's Saturday? Yeah, I learned about this on Thursday night. I didn't start looking into it until Saturday. So Friday. Friday. Yeah, Friday when I was driving up Thursday slash Friday because I didn't get into like midnight. So it's been pretty crazy. There's dozens of docket cases. So this is a very heavily recorded and documented case basis. Um, and so with all the revenge porn in mind, I decided it would be interesting if I brought my group to the party. And so, you know, has anybody ever heard of the organization Badass? Yeah, Badass is the coolest and most badass organization ever. They specifically focus on, uh, run by Ms. Bowman, on hunting down revenge porn sites. And so she's volunteered her time and resources to help me look into this matter. Um, I've got uh, Joe Gray, a very good friend of mine and mentor. Uh, he's helping me with some intelligence stuff. And uh, from my military intelligence and counterintelligence background, I've reached out to people in other countries and other governments to get me information. So that's actually going to be really cool when I get that feedback back. So this is an actively ongoing thing I'm looking into. Um, I don't know if I'll build a campaign on this or not, but definitely going to file some paperwork. Um, and so this is where the allegations kick in because you have to actually understand the individual and the actions they've taken, things that they do, analyze their behaviors. So Mr. Van Dyke, he has said some um, racist things online. Uh, one was in response to an African-American gentleman of uh, incredibly racist nature, which is unacceptable, obviously, uh, in response to the gentleman posting pictures and information, including his mother's social security number, online on a social media site, uh, which still doesn't make it acceptable, but that's the background behind that. And then Mr. Retzlaff has uh, <laughs> quite the list. Uh, starting from uh, having his children taken away from him to uh, p for pedophilic tendencies, uh, for to being accused of sexual assault, domestic violence, burglary. Um, he had his uh, daughter accuse him of posting her naked photos on sites. Um, like the he's been convicted of theft, uh, tampering with evidence, uh, falsifying government records, possession of a weapon on a military school. Uh, <laughs> providing harmful uh, uh, material to a minor. So this, uh, it's quite the scene down here in Texas. Not our scene, but definitely a scene to look into. Um, and uh, this gentleman has been actively engaging in campaigns and something that I've been uh, teaching here about when I noticed almost immediately uh, since 2014. So this has been a five-year campaign. So to give you an idea of your adversaries and their activities, they will run these campaigns against you, sometimes for years. Like with mine, I ran my campaign for two years. I prepped for two years, um, and I built out, well, technically, okay, so that prep work isn't really fair to add on. My prep work was about three to six weeks for the systems for this specific campaign that I'm running, two years running. And then I actively did systems maintenance and upgrades in, in time, um, sorry, um, in real time while I was working the campaign. Um, uh, the campaign itself took me about a year and a half to really understand what I was doing, how to engage people, how to do what I was trying to do actually effectively, and then six months of that dedicated two months of engagement time frame for the first campaign to try to really get my grasp on the people I was engaging, and then four months with two as a downtime, and then the last two months to really turn the pressure up because I was aiming for DerbyCon. But then I just like, you know what, 
I'm not going to make it because of all the situations. And I was like, B-sides, yeah. And so Texas sounded really good. So I was like, you know what? I'll aim for B-sides SATX. And I barely finished by three days. I got the last flag like three days before. Um, uh, so it was like, I think it was like this week that I got the last flag. Um, so really, really hard, um, but I made it. So getting into the systems onto the back ends, you've got uh, Django. Uh, with what I use, Django, I use Django's REST API. It's natively built into the, to the Django platform, very easy to work with. You've got all kinds of systems with that that you can integrate it with natively to include Celery. Um, I love it. You're going to run into some asynchronous issues because you're going to try to run large campaigns. You're going to have to have multiple systems running at the same time, and you're going to want to correlate your data together eventually and merge that data together. When you do that, you're going to have a lot of columns and field data is mismatching, and you're going to have data collision, which is going to cause data loss, which is going to cause cascading failures. I know this is a mistake that I made, and when I did that, I lost entire campaigns. They were small campaigns, but I still lost them. And so uh, you want to have that uh, set out and laid out. Your pairing issues, if you're going to do any kind of synchronization between Linux servers, make sure your pairs are both actively running. I made the mistake of not bridging my connections properly, and I had breakdowns on my communications between my servers that were pairing with the databases on both sides, and I ended up with data corruption from that. And replication issues, if you're going to replicate the data to have high availability and higher performance, make sure the replications are set up properly and running properly. Test them before you use them. Uh, I made that mistake as well. Uh, your data, when you go to build your database systems, I initially started without the current systems that I have, so I just ran a, a Ceph cluster with clustered systems. Your Ceph box, you want to have a triplicated Ceph node, um, which is where Juju will come in handy. You, uh, Juju will actually help you natively deploy those with minimal efforts, and uh, it will really help you with the macro control of that. Um, I recommend a three to one or greater because any more than any less than that, it's really overkill for the nodes. And then anything, if you really want to scale it, don't go to anything over twenty to one for OSD boxes to the the Cephmon system because then it's going to start to overwork your Cephmon systems and they'll slow down. Um, and then uh, dedicated networks. I found if you dedicate your networks, they'll run better. Um, so split those up. If you get really 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 large, put the OSDs on one network, put the Cephmons on another network, and then just let them intercommunicate through L two L three. Uh, and then Portainer. Uh, Portainer, I found that if I used templates, I drastically improved my performance and my administrative times. So I drastically lowered how much time I put into managing the system itself, uh, including with network storage. Portainer will allow you to configure that into the templates. Uh, the Postgres databases, always triplicate your clusters. Anything else, it just blows up in my face. But again, I suck at databases, so I would recommend um, whatever you're comfortable with, but I use Postgres. I always triplicate now. And I do masters and slaves. I do a master for writes. I do my clusters for slaves for reads. And that's because I want one to be writing to one system and one to be reading from another. So my performance on my read times is going to be harder on my systems. Because once you do something, you're not going to all send me all your messages at once. You're going to message me over time. But once I have that, I want to write to that master and I want it to replicate to the slaves. And then the slaves will be the ones that I'm doing all my data processing with. And so I don't have to worry about that. Load balancing, pick your poison. I mean, I've had a lot of good times and good experiences with Apache and HA Proxy. Feel free to do whatever you want. So a lot of people love Nginx for some reason. Um, I've never had a good experience with it, but I'm also not familiar with it. And so I don't want to speak ill of the software because it's got a lot of great history, a lot of great performance. Theoretically, it performs better than an HA Proxy on a performance basis, but that's also because everything's on a single process from what I've read up on and seen. And if that process fails, everything fails. And that's why I like HA proxy. If a process dies on HA proxy, all my other processes stay up. Um, but that's my choice. Selenium. Selenium will allow you to do a lot of things uh, for your instances for automated logins. And you can also have built-in proxies in the browsers that you're using. And so when you're doing that with Selenium, there's a lot of things you can do with Selenium to include automations of IP points. So if you want to use proxies for hundreds of accounts, thousands of accounts, tens of thousands of accounts, you can do that. And you can assign the spaces inside of your containers to take care of that to where each container lot is using specific profiles. So that your profiles, you can have like a profile lot for uh, on one stack for Asia, another stack for the, the Pacific region uh, or Australia or the U.S. or however you want to lot that out and break that down with. You can allocate, okay, I want more people on this campaign for the U.S. campaigns against 
I don't know, cats versus dogs. And so I want more dogs and cats. All right, I need more in the U.S. I'll put that in that lot, deploy them on that lot. It'll eat more resources from that lot, but you know what hardware it's pulling from, so you know which one to buy more gear for. So it's very easy to manage that. You can use Xamarin for mobile if you really want to get actively involved in engaging people on the standard platforms and not get caught. You want to break that in between mobile and browser-based, and you want that to average out to, inter to international standards. If it doesn't make sense, social media platforms get suspicious really fast. And so if the statistical anomalies start to pop up, they're going to start shutting your bot accounts down. So you don't want that. Um, uh, like I said, Tango with the Django, it really does help me. I'm not saying you have to learn Django, but it was so much easier with Django because it's got so many templates. Celery is a godsend. You can automate almost every type of task imaginable with Celery, and it's phenomenal. Uh, you can integrate it with brokers or with SQL, uh, with uh, SQL Alchemy. Uh, you can use it with Redis. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. I absolutely recommend it. It's super cool. I do a lot of patching stuff and maintenance stuff with it. So definitely check it out if you want to. GitLab I use almost exclusively now. And that's because I found that I can do a lot of things with GitLab runners that I couldn't do otherwise. Um, Portainer, like I said, I use Portainer to help me deal with everything. And my email services I use with a generic Django platform I downloaded online. Like... That was awesome from GitHub. I just pulled it off of GitHub. Pick one. There's hundreds. I just found one that I, that I thought sounded cool that could let me use multiple list series so I could build profiles with list series and then the profiles could be automatically emailed or communicated with. Like I said, with the Angry Trash Panda, it will email you. It's super awesome. Um, and then, like I said, I use uh, Juju uh, to help me with the configuration automation. So does uh, I also use Assault. The difference is, is I use micro controls with Salt. I use macro controls uh, with Juju, and the reason is quite simple. Juju is very easy to understand how to use and administrate with. Salt is extremely complex, but it is exceptionally potent and effective, so I recommend both. And so, my last piece is, you can pick one, and I will give you the answer to it. I will give you the answers and information on the Russian hacking and interference allegations, the true amount of debt the United States is actually owed and how that breaks down, how much money the IRS costs every year to run, or the truth about the Cambridge Analytics scandal. And I will let you decide. <laughs> Who wants the first one? Let's see it hands. It'll make it easier. Yeah, democratic process. Two, see, see, this is why Trump won. <laughs> two people voted, man. <laughs> Who's up for number two? Who wants number three? Oh boy. Who wants number four? Oh man. Cambridge Analytics. All right, so check this out. So with Cambridge Analytics, what happened with Cambridge Analytics is it was discovered that Trump leveraged Cambridge Analytics, a UK-based company and organization that was operating as a contract basis in the United States for the purposes and intents of sharing data with individuals expressly for the purpose of profit for the purpose of manipulating election series. What was not disclosed is the fact to most people that Barack Obama did the exact same thing the campaign series before, and this practice has been ongoing since the time of Netscape. They have been sharing their information for direct communications for the purposes and intents of manipulating elections and changing voters' opinion since Netscape. And if anyone wants to know how long that is, that will be out sending to Google because Netscape is older than I am. So that's at least 30 years, well beyond what happened with Cambridge Analytics. And the reason why was specifically and expressly because Cambridge Analytics was a target of political assassination. And that was expressly because of the fact that Cambridge Analytics refused the Clinton contract because Trump paid more, just so you're aware. They both wanted to use Cambridge Analytics. <laughs> but that's that one. Can I get a beer? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, which one do you want? I'll give you one more. All right. No, let's vote on it. You don't just get to scream at me what you want. You got to vote, man. It's a democracy. Who wants Russian hacking? Oh, shit. Okay. Who wants the U.S. debt? No? Okay. All right. Catch me at the beer, and I'll give you that one. 
All right. Does anybody have any questions? Outside, that's totally fine. <laughs>